it's important to have the, the, the learning or trying to make sure that you understand that there's a scale of impact that you can have with your daily actions and try to figure out which ones who have the highest returns, right? You wouldn't want to keep cash in an envelope when you could be investing uh, in someone's company that is doing something that uh, you want to support. <laughs> Marcelo Garcia is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Marcelo is a creator of the wisdomaccelerator.org, a concept for high potential global teenagers with the flagship event taking place in Davos every single year during the, the forum or the World Economic Forum as well as smaller events in multiple locations around the world. Smart City expert with the United Nations for Economic Commission for Europe and IESE. Um, you can find that under pppcities.org. It's uh, what he does is basically often attend relevant United Nations conferences around the world. Originally from Rio de Janeiro, but based in Europe since the last millennia. Already, he has been to 125 countries and can communicate in nine languages with varying levels of fluency. Marcelo is a member of explorers.org, the club of the famous firsts, as other members um, have been the first to the North Pole, the first to the South Pole, the first to the summit of Everest, the first to the deepest point in the ocean, and the first on the surface of the moon. Um, he's involved in many different organizations, a lot around wisdom and education and new methods of thoughts. Marcelo is a friend and we know each other, not only from the forum at Davos, but from internet as well as the last time well it wasn't the last time but one of the the first times we saw each other live was at pioneers in austria at the hofburg palace which was a fabulous uh event and a great time we uh, shared coffee and went back into the speaker's lounge and met a lot of other great people and and had some great introductions and conversations Marcelo, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Well, it's amazing to be here. And it always helps when you meet someone for the first time in a palace, doesn't it? I mean, uh, you, you don't forget that very easily. No, not at all. We, that was a fabulous experience. And then uh, uh, not too long afterwards, we met at H Farm again live and enjoyed an even more relaxed type of not only great wisdom and unconference, kind of this uh, Chatham House rules around great thought leaders in the world where they were talking about high level topics, new business models, new ways of thinking and learning, as well as we just had an incredible time with wonderful food and experience of uh, seeing Venice and Italy. And, and uh, I remember uh, we, we had some nice times on, on, on the boat together where, where we enjoyed each other's companies and some good laughs. I was dressed like a tree, so uh, that's uh, not easily uh, forgotten either, but it was an amazing evening. And, yeah, uh, I mean, you decorated your beard out of nowhere. You had a much longer beard at that time and, and put on some lights, and you were a camouflage uh, uh, at first like a tree, and then it became a Christmas tree, and then it changed even again over the night. But we had a wonderful time. I believe I was... Uh, 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 dressed as Gandalf or something. I had this long hooded robe on and I also was uh, was touting a beard. So we we had uh, uh, a great time and I, I just look back at it fondly. And uh, you've also involved me over, over the times in some of your ways and uh, meetings for, for youth. And the, the last <clears throat> big meeting was online during the pandemic, but the one before that was actually in a beautiful center in the open form of, of Davos, um, of the form, where I brought in the Youth Form Switzerland, the International School of Zuckenler CERN, their uh, whole 
students that were there at the open forum at Davos came by and we had a, a meeting where we uh, spoke to them and kind of gave them a presentation about the sustainable development goals and about what you were doing. So we've really had some, if you think about it, some wonderful times together, but all this experience that you've had, you know, you've been doing this for a while, you've been an explorer, a thought leader, really very active in your life doing amazing things and we'll, we'll get much more into that. We've just lived through and we still are living through this crazy pandemic time, Black Lives Matters, Belarus, the inauguration, and I could go on and on with all the craziness we've experienced. How have you weathered this time? What's happened? What things have bubbled to the surface and how, how have you emerged or are still emerging on the other end of, of all of this craziness? Well, it's really uh, uh, unique, right? So uh, I guess you will be relating a lot to that. I was traveling 95% of the time, going to all of those different conferences and uh, speaking to a whole bunch of places or you know, joining for uh, networking uh, reasons. And then it went down to zero. Now, when you have a, a binary switch, it, it's almost like we went into a, a travel fasting. Like, you no, know, fasting means many things. You can fast for sugar, you can fast for cigarettes, you can fast for food. But in this case, is uh, the fasting of uh, human connections, uh, the fasting from uh, stress in many ways, like the uh, the time that it has to waste, you no, know, going to the airport and checking in and you no. Know, missing something and uh, eventually you get the prize which is arriving at the location and um, getting the value that justified you going there in the first place and all of a sudden that went down to zero so from my perspective that was great it was almost like i was shifting from exploring by going far to exploring by going deep and you uh well at least in my case i started by being a very curious person uh, by nature uh, trying to understand what's going on, what are the implications, what can I do to help? And we had a concept for Wisdom Accelerator, which was very much based on meeting in person, having teenagers from all around the world that will be flying uh, to Davos uh, as our main location uh, with one of the parents, either the mother or the father would have to come with them so that they could make friends for life, they could learn things that so they wouldn't be able to learn in a traditional education uh, framework. And um, in principle, have the best possible week of their lives, right? This is how the program was designed. And all of a sudden, we had to take away the element of the travel, the excitement, seeing snow for the first time, meeting people from the other side of the planet that uh, may or may not have things in common. And that became a challenge, right? Uh, one of the things that I heard uh, recently is that pain is unavoidable, suffering isn't. Suffering is in your mind, pain is physical, suffering is mental. And if you try to look at difficult situations, like your business is very much, I mean, we're a nonprofit, but then again, no, that's how I spend my time. It's very painful to see it not bearing the fruits that we had planned for and having the expectation that this will remain the case for another two, maybe three years. It looks like it's going to be more like a year and a half to two years, thanks to the vaccines that are being developed and are now being um, distributed. But at the very beginning, it was um, fuzzy, right? So what do you do? And the idea uh, initially was, let's try to fight the last battle. So we had the plan after Davos last year to have an event in Singapore and then another one in New York. So we could have a big event uh, in the major time zones and that was part of the grand plan and making sure that uh, as a nonprofit entity, we could get the participation of as many teenagers and families as possible. So we're trying to do Singapore, maybe we can do something just with teenagers from Asia because all you know, the restrictions are not going to be as severe. And then it started shutting down borders. Like, oh, let's try to do something just with the teenagers from Singapore and maybe something smaller. And then they could leave home. And at that point in time, it, it's not even pivoting in this case because the core concept, we still want to do Davos next year, right? And negotiating the location and planning to do something even significantly bigger and better than what we've done uh, in the last uh, two years. But at the point in time when it became obvious 
that insisting on trying to have a live event is just foolish, it, it rings a bell, which is when to grit and when to quit. Right? You know, having endurance and resilience is really important. Having the ability to grit for a very long time is something that I deeply care about. And I've done a few things you know, to test uh, the limits of what I'm personally capable of doing. But you have to know when to quit, which is in this case, it's just pressing a big pause button and say, look, what can I do in the meantime, which is going to be building the long-term value for when the situation is back to normal. And uh, in this period, I'm trying to collect new pieces of the puzzle that are going to make it a more beautiful you know, uh, final product once it's completed. So how can I extend what I'll be doing with a five to 10 year mindset rather than, oh my God, I had planned to do this in three months and it's not happening. And all of a sudden it gets into this spiral of suffering, which is all in your mind, right? You no, know, the, the number of things that we're really obliged to do uh, is quite limited. You have to respect the laws. You have to make sure that you behave in an ethical and civic manner, but within those boundaries, you have total freedom, right? So you can use your energy and the time that you have to do multiple things. And I'm hoping that many people will realize that uh, as we did, um, we need to get people to meet in person and that's no longer possible. It's like, oops, I shouldn't have put so much effort in a, a single track. Right? So I really hope that uh, lots of people are now are trying to figure out that volatility is part of life, that maybe you should do the Pareto rule of 80% doing the real life thing, 20% doing the online thing because you never know. And all of a sudden the online thing becomes 100%. And that's what we ended up doing. And you were at the very first edition of the Wisdom Accelerator Online, which is what you have in my background, the neoway.org, uh, way being Wisdom Accelerator for Youth. And the Neo is a bit like you no know, taking the hat off for the matrix uh, and uh, the character in here. Uh, you know, looking for his truth. Uh, what it's trying to do is to have sessions every month where we are inviting really interesting people who have accomplished something that you know, got them to be curated, uh, to share the wisdom with teenagers. And what's interesting in this case is that we try to make sure that half of our speakers are below 30. So many of them are in their early 20s. And they're very puzzled when I ask them, you know, could you come on stage and share your wisdom? They're like, I'm 23, what wisdom do I have? It's like, well, from the perspective of a teenager, not only you have a lot of wisdom, your knowledge is much more relevant than an 80 year old PhD who won a Nobel Prize, right? As in, there's a lot of respect for the older person, but you have a generation gap that most teenagers go like yeah okay boomer kind of no i i like what it did but that was last millennium and when you have the uh, younger ones they're basically saying look no if you want to get to the best university in singapore i suggest that you do a b and c and the Nobel prize winner will have no idea you know, the, the type of help and support and the wisdom that can be shared is different it's still extremely very Value, which is why half of our speakers are older than 30. We try to make sure there's gender balance. So this month well, we have you know, half of them being men, half of them being women. It's more or less uh, around this um, distribution that I have it every month. And we're going to the 10th edition already with uh, 300 speakers in total. And uh, we uh, try to make sure that everybody benefits. Right? So what I've noticed is that the speakers are using this somehow as uh, a check-in. They go like, oh, no, what do I have that is useful to future generations that are going to give continuity to society? No, how can I make sure that that future is as bright as it can be by chipping in with what I've learned? And well, after 300 speakers, you start seeing patterns, right? Which is why I invite so many people from so many different places. And you have um, you have to challenge yourself. You should um, not be afraid of asking for help. You should try different things and you know, look at failure, not as failure, but just as a lesson that lets you become more successful in the future. So the idea is to compile you know, all of this wisdom, to distill it somehow uh, in a universal uh, wisdom 
magic potion that the teenagers can you know, leverage to make better decisions uh, in the future. And you know, just to have a, a bit of a, a break, you know, don't want to, to be a monologue. Um, what happened in this case is that we had a great concept, which is no less great because we had to stop it for two years. And we're using those two years to create something that allows it to be even greater in the future. So by having it online, I can start inviting people with disabilities who live in Papua New Guinea, right? And if they have a decent internet connection and they understand English, which will be the case in Papua New Guinea uh, as an example, why not? I mean, they're not going to be coming to Davos. I mean, it's too complicated, it's too expensive. I surely hope that many of them will in the future, but by having an online version of the program, we're truly universal. So I would say that close to 1 billion teenagers uh, between 13 and 17 in the world. That's my own calculation based on the uh, United Nations uh, statistics I've seen. And um, many of them can understand English or can at least um, benefit uh, from the session somehow before we start doing mm -hmm. translations, et cetera. And uh, we're hoping that we're going to serve as a motivation, right? So we, they can be on stage because it's a Zoom meeting, right? The interactivity is, Total. Like if they want to have a chat with you and ask about work you've been doing, they have a chance to do so. But you want to go beyond and I'll tell you a bit more about our future plans uh, after you give me your opinion on what I shared so far. Uh, well, there's actually four things that came up in what you said, which is uh, you, you answered the question so eloquently, but it's, it's also the, it's about exactly what you said. It's about going deep. So there's there's no quick pitch or quick answer to, to what you gave. And that's what I really love to hear back, that uh, it was a different way of going deep as well. And I like the parallels that you that you show, you know, with the Neo referring to the matrix, you know, <clears throat> kind of a, a new matrix, very digital, very kind of online. It's a plugged in to the grid. Some some are still trapped in the matrix and feeding feeding that system and others are now trying to <clears throat> emerge with wisdom, seeing the world in a different way. Um, the one big thing that comes up in that, and, I, and this is one of the points that I want to touch on, maybe have you address that, but I, I, I do want to cover all four, four of the things that came up in, in the, in the, you know, when you were speaking. The first one is um, when, when you're, you're um, the world around us, whether it's a pandemic or not, is growing exponentially, good, bad, and ugly. So um, it's continuing to uh, have climate issues, environmental issues, health issues. There's, there's also positive growth in, in the emergence of new food technologies and cellular agriculture, and there's new technologies and going to Mars and the moon and, and the privatization of the space race. And then there's new uh, protein folding. There's all these new things that are continuing to grow and move and, and keep up with this exponential world. But now we've been kind of in this lockdown area, this kind of isolation one from another, social distancing. Um, but we still, as humanity, need to, to keep up with that growing world. We need to gain new wisdoms. We need to find out ways how in a confined space or maybe in, in, in our human zoos or locked up that we still are up to speed so that it, if it ever emerges or as the World Economic Forum says, the great reset and we go back to events, go back to inter, get, interacting with each other, that uh, we're up to speed with where the world has continued to grow regardless that we've been in, in a lockdown situation. But because we need those innovations, those technologies, those six major transformations to get us to that brighter future, one that uh, eliminates human suffering and environmental problems. Um, and I, I believe one way you hit the nail on the head is by going deep it's okay that we're in lockdown and what well, we can't make. There's another way that we can have that impact by going deep and, and coming up with the solid plans and ways to, to emerge or act in these situations that we can still be prepared for that time. I don't know if you want to make a comment about that or how your thoughts or feelings are on that, but th this would be a time and then I'll cover the other three. I mean, 
I'd like to make a distinction between education and learning, right? And education, from my perspective, is very structured. Uh, it hasn't changed much in the last 100, 150 years. And um, it's just perceived, sadly, as a necessary evil. Like you want to fit in society, and this is sort of the ticket. Like okay? you have multiple tiers, you can have just the basic ticket or you can have the VIP ticket, and then you become an expert in something with lots of degrees, but um, you have to follow those roles. And when I look at your background, there's a stunning um, library. You know, I don't know if it's uh, a real place. I surely hope it yeah, is. Trinity College. Oh, incredible. Library. Yeah. Um, what happens there is that if you get a young person, and our focus on teenagers is pretty much because they're blank slates. Right? So they are mature enough to make many good decisions. So if you try to have this kind of conversation with a nine-year-old, you know, it's not going very far. It's going to be useful, but there are limits to the usefulness until they are mature enough. And if they're below 18, they still feel that they are being sheltered, which they are. You know, they usually live with the parents and they have lots of limitations to the emotions, um, uh, the possibilities of uh, personal choice. So it, that's when you come to them and say, let's go to Trinity and here's a library and everything that is here has been recognized as being valuable for a very long time, right? So if you um, have the ancient wisdom, but I mean, practical wisdom, well, one of the reasons why uh, in Asia, brown rice was considered to be um, peasant food like, no, if you can afford, you have white rice, which is still the case today, is because the husk of the rice has lactins that are there to protect the plant and they're not well absorbed by the body and that causes lots of trouble. So you're an expert in food, I'm quite sure you've heard about that one. So if Asians have been avoiding brown rice for 5,000 years and all of a sudden there's a new age guru saying the brown rice is better because it's closer to nature, it's like, who is more likely to be right? Like people have been doing this for 5,000 years or this guy who just you know, has zero consequences in terms of being wrong about his choices, uh, has not, or could be a woman herself, but wait, no, no, not trying to be sexist here in terms of new age gurus. And um, I think that people should try to focus on learning through curiosity and joy. Like try to get out of the structure. And I don't want to call it the matrix, but it is a matrix. Like the education system worldwide is a matrix in the sense it is a very structured. You have you know, um, lots of choices that you can make, but you can't really go out of the box. If you get to a library, like the one uh, on the background, you're completely free. Right? So one of the things that I'm doing now uh, to maximize serendipity when it comes to learning is reading six books at the same time, one chapter at a time. So uh, I'll jump from a book on fasting to a book on telomeres to a book on cryptocurrencies, one chapter at a time. And I'm hoping that this allows me to make connections that I wouldn't make otherwise. And this is close impossible to do in the standard uh, education system and professional life as well, right? The many things that you just cannot do within the boundaries of the corporation you're working for, or even if you're an entrepreneur, that's also the case. So uh, I would really hope that people try to focus more on learning than on the education bits, because education right now is very challenging. So the uh, uh, the limits that are being imposed are even stricter because of online classes and everything else. And this is very frustrating, but try to if possible, use this energy that is feeding your frustration towards something productive is energy anyway, right? So if you try to look at a problem and go like, no, this is really annoying. I'm just being upset with myself for being in a situation and I feel powerless because there's nothing you can do. You're wrong. There's a lot that you can do. You can use this energy to say, let me get a big, bright yellow sticker and put it on the top of this problem and call it a challenge. So my challenge is how can I use this energy in a positive way to create a better future for myself, but don't think about next week, next month, next year. Think 10 years from now. 
right? No, if you want to go to the extreme case, you could say, what would you like people to write on your tombstone? Like this person did A, B, C, D. So all of a sudden you're looking at a hundred years time span, which is very likely to become standard. I mean, some people say that uh, limits are 120, 130. So let's say 100 is a pretty good deal. So if you have a, I'm not claiming that people should be doing that, but like a hundred years plan, like try to figure out what the end looks like. Uh, how many people are coming to your funeral? It's uh, morbid in a way to talk about death, but I think death as a reference is very useful. And you look, all the things that you're doing right now, for how long do they matter? And what do they matter for? Are they the foundations of something more beautiful? As in, I'm in Venice right now. They are insane. They're running out from Attila the Hun uh, in the year 450 when you know, the uh, Roman Empire is still barely going. And they figured out that if they got those trees um, from a specific forest and they buried them in the mud, uh, those trees would petrify and be as good as you know, concrete pillars. And then I could build things on top. And all of a sudden there's a city with 60,000 people that literally floats on a lagoon. As in, I've been here for a week. This place is just bonkers. It's the most beautiful city in the world, bar none, because of the creativity and the effort that was required. But they turn their fear of Attila into something productive. It's like, hey, let's get pragmatic here. Uh, my cousin Giovanni just figured out that you can you know, you know, use those trees as a pillar and all oh, his house has been going on for 10, 15 years. So maybe I should try to do the same. And hey, there's a lot of fish here and we have boats anyway. So if you ever need to go back to the mainland to trade, we're fine. We have everything that we need. And all of a sudden that was the kernel of what became Venice. So I, I really hope that people out there will build their own Venice. Right? They'll be able to do something truly beautiful with their lives that has an impact on over multiple generations. And that in fact was fear becoming power, becoming action, getting solutions that were limited in the terms of time and space. They had to stick around here. They uh, you know, had to protect themselves. They had to survive and eventually thrive they built an empire from that. So try to develop something that could become your own empire. I mean, it's not a good word, but your own um, pride and joy, like something that once you get to the end of a hopefully very happy and productive life, people are going to say, wow, this person lived a good life. He, he or she had a life worth living. And ancient Greeks had a name for that. It's called eudaimonia. Well, daimonia uh, means good spirits, right? So it is like you, uh, back then, the idea is that you have a life that is guided by good angels. They are leading you into the right direction. And the right direction is not necessarily the easiest, right? So if you've done endurance sports, you realize that that is not pleasant. You don't do that because you're enjoying it. You do that because you want to get to the summit of the mountain. And you know that the feeling of achievement is amazing and stays with you forever. You know that the physical preparation that you will achieve as well um, by you know, having a very ambitious target is also going to be good for you. So try to understand that many of the problems they're having in your life, they're not problems at all. They're hints, they're like good spirits telling you, go through this path. It's not going to cause you permanent harm. It's something that is going to allow you to grow as a person, but make sure that you know where you're going. And this is the tricky part, like the sense of purpose, the sense of what, I mean, sometimes when I meet people in on conferences like Kinternet, I'll ask them, um, so why are you here? They'll say, oh, because it's a great conference. Like, no, why are you on this planet? Why do you exist? What is the purpose and the meaning at the deepest level of, of your life? And I tend to get two responses. Either they kind of very slowly and quietly leave the conversation 
or we get into a very deep and interesting discussion, more of the latter than the former. Because in these conferences, you tend to meet people who are in this kind of mindset, right? And they have an answer, or at least you trigger the thought process that allows them to figure out, yeah, good point. And what we do with the Wisdom Accelerator sessions online and also the live ones, but you know, the last 10 months, the online version, uh, I usually ask the speakers to imagine that they can travel back in time and spend 20 minutes with their teenager selves. How would they use those 20 minutes to maximize the value of the life of that teenager that will become themselves? So go back in time, 10, 15, 30, 50 years, no? Depends on how old the speaker is. What are the things that you could have told to yourself as a teenager in 20 minutes that would have the maximum impact? And that's where they get value in the present. You go like, wow, no, I, I would have given this advice to myself as a 15 year old, but I'm not doing it myself now that I'm 60 or whatever age it is. And that gets them to think. So Wisdom Accelerator is supposed to add value to everybody who's participating, right? So the younger ones get practice in public speaking and structuring the thoughts and uh, also the sense of purpose. And the older ones that go like, oh, okay, I, I've misguided myself without even realizing, but this is a reset, right? We're talking about the word reset, which may or may not be popular in some circles, so people who are pro or against the web. Um, but uh, the fact that you're placing a flashlight on a, a spot that was in the shadow for so long allows you to figure out, do I want to do something about that? Or one option is doing nothing, right? So you just turn off the flashlight and pretend you've never seen it. And my feeling is that most people can't do that. Once they, they cannot unsee it. Yeah, they once, you, once it. you've turned on that light, it's hard to turn it off again. It's extremely hard to turn it off again. You, you've just opened up about seven more rabbit holes that we could go down in, in much more depth. But I wanna go back to the, the last three. Um, there, there is one comment and one of the new things that you, you just brought up, uh, the extra seven that came in there. And that is, um, I totally agree. It's this purpose for existing. You, you really need to find out your purpose for existing, know why you're here. But also, um, unlike the library behind me, um, you should live your life like uh, you're you're writing your tombstone, but also even more importantly, um, how would you give somebody uh, a tour of your museum of life? And was today and as tomorrow or was yesterday a good museum day? Did you do something? Did you learn something? Did you have wisdom that you would be proud when you're giving someone a tour on your museum of life? to show them that day, or was it just the day you ate chips and watched football or you know whatever whatever it was that you decided to sleep that day away and it, there's not much to show on your your tour of this this museum of life. And so I believe there's there's tons of nuggets there, but I I also with education and learning, it's deep, it's complex and everything that we're talking about is dealing with complexity science and systems thinking and and really the dynamics of of life which um, at sometimes can be very chaotic theory and games theory that they're so complex to understand but i love how you break them down for youth for everyone to kind of understand based on where they're at and, and in the learning aspect i really want to um go into a couple things so uh august 21st 2020 last year, uh, Sir Ken Robinson uh, passed away um, well before his time because of illness. But in reality, he was already beginning a new movement of how we revamp from education to a learning model, revamp to an individual model that we're not teaching uh, fish how to climb a tree and, and monkeys how to swim and getting them to a point of mediocrity, but that we're uh, giving them wisdom to apply to life, to apply to the future of life and, and, and things. And so um, 
also at Pioneers, we met um, <clears throat> Professor Nikki Eberhardt, and um, she was also on, on your ways uh, um, speaking to your students. And I was as well, I was one of the first you said, and, and I, I really wanna get some feedback because I'm one of the ones who are, who are in the 50, going on 50 plus now, um, that uh, I speak to a lot of youth, I speak to a lot around the world, and I, I tend to wonder, am I reaching them? Am I falling on deaf ears? Is my message correct? Can I depart that wisdom to them and get them to see the world in a different way? And so, um, I, I believe you gave me a little bit of feedback, but I would like to know um, how, how do, when uh, Grandpa Mark shows up at Waze and starts to speak to them, how is that accepted? It, it, did it come across good? Or do you realize that there's maybe some, some things that, that I'm doing wrong or uh, are better ways to reach the audience? Or uh, am, am I, uh, is Nikki in alignment uh, she's also in, in that plus, and as you are as well, um, to reach those audiences, to give them the right wisdom and, and messages that they need to to give them a beautiful museum day, or to get them to think about the future. Well, you and Nikki are probably two of the best sessions we had so far, and it, it's quite amusing because either you introduced me to her or she introduced me to you. I can't recall. It was uh, it was me. Yeah, uh -huh. it was probably uh, another around uh, because she was moderating a session, right? And um, you're leveraging the fact that you're focused on food, and it's very hard for people not to be interested in food, right? So it's a topic that will trigger uh, anyone. Uh, you come across as uh, calm and collected because you are, as uh, very genuine and spontaneous because you are, and uh, teenagers uh, connect with that because it's non-threatening, it's interesting, and it gives them something that can stay with them to mature over time, right? So it is not the, uh, the kind of education based on fear of failure. Like if you don't pass the exam, your life is over. In many Asian countries, you have one exam and that's it. Like if you don't get it right, uh, not many good options uh, out there. I think in most Western countries, there's a lot more flexibility, but then again, it's still limited. And you, in many ways, represent, and Nick is the same. She was storytelling about when she was diving in this cave and passed out, and her buddy saved her. It was like this mini adventure story. So it's very, very gripping. And you're basically sharing all your knowledge and you're giving them paths, you're giving them choices, right? So I would say that my favorite word in English and whatever equivalent happens to be in other languages is optionality which is kind of a weird choice, right? Some people say it's happiness or you no know, Sunday uh, or banana split, but optionality from my perspective is giving every single human, regardless of their age, as many good options as possible in life at the lowest possible cost. So if you had uh, a magic lamp that would allow you to have your personal genie that would just grant you any wish, and it costs you nothing. It's not like you have three wishes, have as many as you want. Like you have the, the full freehold property to the lamp. Um, would you be happy then? Like it depends, right? If you're, again, pain is unavoidable, suffering isn't. If you are traveling to the moon as you know, one of the first to be in a rocket to do the, the space exploration like this uh, Japanese uh, gazillionaire, uh, who booked himself and a bunch of friends uh, for a little ride uh, over there. And while you're orbiting the moon, you're really upset because you're missing out on a super cool party that your producer friend is organizing in LA. That's your problem, right? I mean, there is something called being too present, right? So you, you're not uh, enjoying the present. So, Crack addicts are completely focused on the present. You don't want to be a crack addict, right? So the whole thing of the power of now and being present, it, it comes with an asterisk. So do enjoy what you're doing right now. 
keep in mind that uh, there's a cost of opportunity for everything you're doing. You could be, again, a gazillionaire and you're deeply unhappy because you're only thinking about the things you're missing out because you're orbiting the moon, but that's your choice, right? So the, the point being, uh, you and Nikki are basically giving the teenagers options in life, saying, look, you could do this, you could do that. I'm giving you a couple of hints. This is how you can take action. And um, I uh, think that this is why those are two of the most popular sessions, right? And this is how we can help them. If I try to force teenagers to study uh, Eskimo culture, um, architectural design, thermal insulation, and uh, teamwork as four different papers that they must answer correctly, otherwise they don't pass and they are going to be punished. I am not going to get as much enthusiasm and effort as I get when I tell them, let's build an igloo, right? So here's a person who's an expert at building igloos, two thirds or more of the participants in Davos had never seen snow in their life and all of a sudden saying, would you like to build an igloo? Yeah, they wake up at seven in the morning to build an igloo. And yet they're learning about Eskimo culture, about architectural design, about thermal insulation and about teamwork, right? Because you have you know, people stomping the snow, have people cutting, have people moving and the ones replacing it. So I always try to be sneaky and uh, get the learning disguise in the fun, right? So what we're doing that was in order to try to do online as well is to make sure it's as much fun as possible. And with my own daughter, I know her, uh, being my co-founder and inspiration for the whole idea, I uh, always try to do that, right? So one of the concepts we have for Wisdom Accelerator is to have a round the world trip. So literally, will be spending two or three, maybe four weeks where the families are coming with the teenagers and maybe, no, nope, both parents are going to be there and they'll bring along the older siblings or younger siblings, but we'll be flying around the world once things go back to normal, stopping in you no know, five or six different countries, doing crazy things like going to a volcano in Hawaii and then you know, going to a temple in Japan and meeting really interesting local people because this is now more affordable than ever. I mean, I actually did that in 2018 with my daughter as a, a, a trial pilot. And the total cost of the flights to go around the world were, was around $1,000. We were flying from Hawaii to Japan for $130. It, it sounds insane because it kind of is, but all of a sudden you go like, oh, okay. All of a sudden, this is affordable, right? And how much value are you getting by flying around the world with a child and observing how you know, she's doing in certain circumstances in Japan or in Hawaii or whatever it happens to be? Uh, the parents will respect them more. They'll give them more freedom because they're outside of the normal routine. So experimentation just uh, becomes a standard. And uh, I'm really hoping to be able to do that in maybe two years, right? So we'll be flying around the world, a big group, um, normal low cost airlines. I'm hoping that most of them will survive. Otherwise this could be done as a charter flight. No, there's nothing preventing us from you know, filling a, a whole plane uh, with amazing teenagers and the parents. And I had to plan the pilot in 2018. So what I did was to get a flip chart, put it outside in the garden. And my daughter was with me back then. And I was giving her anchor points saying, look, our project is to fly from A to A, going around the world. So we know what you want to do, you just don't know how. Now to make it more interesting, let's just say that uh, we don't book the tickets until one or two days before we actually fly. So that if you want to stick around in Japan for a few days more, that's fine. No, we don't have to you know, fly that day. We can just book the ticket because we're monitoring to make sure the prices are not going up and it worked out perfectly well. But I wanted her to use this fuel, like the motivation of flying around the world and going to all of those countries. And she's crazy about Japan, which is what I'm mentioning all the time. And Hawaii was also amazing. We went to six of the seven islands because the big island was having an eruption. So we kind of gave it a miss this time. And um, I, uh, I told her, look, here's an app called Skyscanner. 
we're trying to go from A to A. We know that you want to go to Japan. We know that we have to you know, cross the Pacific via Hawaii because it was way too expensive, like 10X or 20X more. Try to go through Skyscanner and figure out which are the days, how many days you'd like to spend in California, where are you flying from in Europe, and um, try to figure out how you can optimize the three weeks that we have to do this uh, to get maximum value as you define value. What I was doing was teaching her linear programming, optimizing routes based on certain constraints. Like if I came to her and said, let's go outside and study linear programming for two hours, I would probably not the same, have the same level of enthusiasm, right? And she would have learned. Like it would have been education. You wouldn't have been learning to the extent that she achieved because there was purpose. I, I, literally, the better we plan this round the world trip, the more value you personally get. And I'm always trying to figure out how can I sneakily find fun things to do that are not only relevant to the teenagers now, but will be relevant for the rest of their lives. Is in understanding how to book a flight and the fact that if you miss this day, there's another one in two days because you know how to check and you've been in this situation before. So you're fine. So when you face adversity, there is pain, there's no suffering. You just figure out, okay, what am I getting out of this? I'm stuck in Taiwan for an extra day. People pay a lot of money to be stuck in Taiwan for an extra yeah. day, right? So don't be upset. Be happy that you can be there. And uh, yeah, so th that's kind of part of the, the mojo of what I try to do. It's tricky online to find fun stuff, but um, we're, we're doing well so far. And thank you for being part of it. Oh, I, I, it was a sheer pleasure. And, and every time you answer another question, another five or six open up to go even deeper, we could really go into rabbit holes uh, during our whole conversation. There is one, and you've basically answered it throughout our whole discussion already, but I want to bring it to the surface and make sure that those um, listening truly understand. Going deep, uh, long events, long talks. So um, I, I long ago have given up the TED Talks, the elevator pitches, give me the short version. And um, you, you basically answered this in the way you've answered your questions and talking about going deep. What are, you, what are your thoughts and feelings about the, the trend or not even trend that where our world's going most of the, the, the best podcasts in the world are about uh, an hour to two hours long. Um, you know, the, the videos online for deep learning, deep wisdom as they're, they're minimum an hour long because, and, and discussions about a thousand page books or 700 page books, they're not done in 15 minutes anymore. And if they are, they're not worth the, the, the time in most cases uh, uh, to, to watch because you're not getting the true substance out of them. There's, um, in, in my opinion, there's there's no way to to get this cliff notes version on some of these deep learnings or these things to where where you really can have a takeaway. And and so the question around that, not only that I, I believe you believe in that philosophy as well. But how do youth deal with that? Because it's, you know, we're in a world of social media and Snapchat and, and Twitters and, and, and these things where, you know, sometimes yeah, my kids, my adult children and, and my grandchildren are not of the age yet to, to uh, use social media or have a phone. But how do they deal with that? Because they've kind of been brought up in a world that, you know, this text, quick, short versions, there's no full sentences or paragraphs in communication. What do you see in the trend in youth when they're presented with, like, I, I believe my my discussion to you guys at Waze, that was at least an hour long, I, I, I believe, maybe even a little bit longer. And then we went almost an hour in questions afterwards, if, if I remember correctly. What are you seeing? How are youth dealing with that? Are they getting bored? Are they handling it? Is it, is it worth it? And what's the trend or what's the direction that you see there? It, it kind of depends on level of materials and interest. Right? So um, 
we tend to attract the teenagers that are uh, seeking answers they uh, cannot get and they um, figured out that this is an interesting person, right? If someone is being curated to speak at our events, they have been recognized for something they've done by an institution we respect. I mean, World Economic Forum, clearly being one of them with the global shapers and young global leaders and so on. And um, I'd just like to dial back to the uh, mention they made of uh, Sir Ken Robinson and um, the fact that he had polio and he had to struggle his whole life by being one of the very final, say, victims of polio. I uh, don't think that he had many younger people uh, than him uh, being affected by the disease because uh, of the vaccination campaigns. And that made him humble. That made him realize that he had so many different limitations and it allowed him most likely to extrapolate that his physical limitations also reflected in his psychological way of looking at things. And he was a very gifted public speaker, a very funny one at that. Now he had lots of TED talks, right? And they tended to be in the longish size, like you know, 18 to 20 minutes. Um, the point being, he had talks with an S. And what happened there is that you watch one of those and go like, I want more of this guy. Like, give me more of this. So the same mental algorithm of having a hook, something that uh, gets your brain interested and then having access to the longer versions kind of works in every situation. So I try to watch all the talks that uh, he gave, not only Ted, and sometimes the concepts would be repeated, but it was always something new and fresh. And because it was so good at delivering the message, I didn't mind that to listen to the same thing three or four times. Right? Uh, it helps you consolidate those memories. And depending on what is happening to you that day, you would interpret what he's saying in a different way. Right? Maybe from the more professional, more personal side, but it's a very strong message and it deserves to be retained. And what I've seen happening recently is that they have this super long format. Like the podcast lasts an hour or three hours in some cases. And um, what they're doing right now is having um, little clips, three to four minutes. And that's not for teenagers, that's basically for everybody you know, leading business lives. And all of a sudden you go like, oh, this is Elon Musk explaining why he wants to go to Mars and the original projects. And that leads me straight into two hours conversation. Like, okay, well, I, I had a sampler. I want to have now the whole thing. And I think that more and more, this is what's going to happen. The other podcasts have done uh, similar in the way that they have the uh, hour long version. And then they have three minutes here, four minutes there, with the most important concepts that would get people to realize, oh, there is value in this for me. I'm in, right? But trying to force people doesn't work. You, yeah. you try to get someone to <clears throat> something for an hour and they go like, I really couldn't care less about that. You're adding negative value to their lives because they'll be bored and upset. We definitely shouldn't force them and, and, and do that at all. There are some some uh, new things that are emerging and some some old things that we're we're discovering how to use more effectively. So for me, I, I, I learn in a different way. So I all also listen on a different speed or um, I, I really like to use the chapters that YouTube and Vimo have where they can actually break it down into chapters where they're nicely or almost bookmarks or timestamps where you could go through and say, okay, this, this stuff I don't need to know, but this I'm really interested or specifically looking for that. And you can go to that. Cindy Chin was also, um, she's a NASA data knot and she was also on my podcast. She um, just founded and co-founded a, a new organization called Clipper, which um, is based with AI and a knowledge a platform taking videos and kind of m making them like Cliff's notes, but also breaking them up into chapters and sections and uh, doing it in a way that it's real time and live and interaction with the audience. So I see some of that really emerging and 
and I am in alignment with that, you need some kind of a teaser first and foremost to even see if it's a value or if that's what the, the collective intelligence that that person wants to have or learn uh, that uh, is good for their passions or, or where they want to go. Um, because some of the materials isn't applicable to everybody for every podcast. I mean, some people want to really get into the specifics. And so those teasers really help. So you've, you've answered that perfectly. And, and uh, the last one is, um, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, and divisions one from another, humanity one from another? And the reason I ask this is because air, food, water are global citizens. The pandemic is this global citizen, COVID. Um, and species don't adhere to borders and, and many other things don't adhere to borders, but us as humanity in, in, in many ways have kind of been <clears throat> confined during this time. And so with that in mind and the way our world works with business and trade, how do you feel about that? I could get into conversations about externalities of uh, keeping your house clean by throwing the trash in your neighbor's garden. And that's what lots of people are doing. Being aware of the consequences of those actions and you know, lots of uh, ecologically minded people don't realize that they're just exporting pollution, right? And uh, I'm not naming names uh, here, just go deeper into what's uh, happening. Uh, uh, one of my uh, pet peeves are those uh, metal um, straws, right? People go, hey, no, let's use metal straws to avoid uh, using plastic straws. Like the amount of energy that goes into making a metal straw is enormous compared to what it takes to make a plastic straw. A far better alternative is paper, biodegradable straws that uh, costs maybe twice as much as a plastic one, but they cause close to zero damage. So the metal straw is just a fashion statement. Right? I mean, maybe I'll get some haters for that, but that's my personal opinion. I, I don't think that it's uh, helping. And in fact, when people implement those fake palliative solutions, but like, oh, I feel better because I'm using a metal straw instead of the plastic ones, it's energy that they are using for something that has a lower level of impact. So the intention is good, the results are not. And that basically means that they don't feel the motivation or don't have the time to do things that have real impact. So it's important to have the, the, the learning or trying to make sure that you understand that there's a scale of impact that you can have with your daily actions and try to figure out which ones who have the highest returns, right? You wouldn't want to keep cash in an envelope when you could be investing uh, in someone's company that is doing something that uh, you want to support if you can uh, afford to support these kind of initiatives. And that leads to the global conversation, right? And many people these days are aware of the fact that there's something called the Dunbar number and Dunbar number is the size of a prefrontal cortex. So no, basically the brain right behind your forehead. And the larger it is, the more meaningful social connections you can make. So a little monkey can only have a little monkey family because they just do not have the uh, frontal cortex to be able to connect with more monkeys. And it, it comes to humans uh, where that number is around 150. And I think that's a big deal, right? So if you try to tell people you need to empathize with 7.7 .7 billion people, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily positive because it's overreaching, it's asking for something that truly is impossible. You, you literally do not have the physiological capacity to relate to 7.7 .7 billion people. You do have the capacity to relate to 150, right? So the ability to deeply care about humans, no matter where they are, to empathize with those that are the closest to your heart and to whatever you're doing. So the global mindset of do whatever you can at a local level, but connect with other people that resonate with you, no matter where they are in the world. And above all, have the ability 
to switch, right? So uh, you may be very interested in collecting stamps when uh, you're 12 and all of a sudden you like fish and you have lots of uh, aquariums at home. I'm kind of describing myself here. <laughs> I had seven uh, aquariums in my room. And uh, that basically means that I'm switching from the stamp collection mindset and connecting with people who like pretty fish at home. That is a very silly example, but the whole point is if you have the ability to use your physiological limitations, the number number of a maximum 150 people you can deeply connect with, having the ability to disconnect and reconnect as needed allows you to maximize the use of that limitation, right? So uh, speed empathy, I guess, could be an Olympic sport, like try to connect with everybody. It doesn't matter um, if they're rich or poor, or smart, not so smart, a completely different culture or know your cousin. And having the curiosity to understand what is a mutual value exchange that is possible with that person. Uh, as in, I've had conversations, this is quite an interesting one. At the, uh, the Munich airport, I uh, noticed that there was this elderly lady. She was probably in her 80s. And uh, she could only speak a language no one could understand. And the police was trying to figure out what is this elderly lady doing at the airport alone? We have no idea where she's going. She cannot communicate with us. And that became the challenge. Like, can I relate to someone who doesn't speak anything that how I, I can use as a tool? So how can we connect as humans? And it so turns out that I recognized her clothes as being from Eritrea. And I had been to Eritrea many years ago. So it's like, no, she looks like she's from the Tigrina tribe. Not many people would have that information, but I did, right? And it was purely coincidental. So I, I started trying to uh, use Arabic words with her because the you know, half Muslim in uh, Eritrea and maybe should be familiar with some of those words. And um, she uh, mentioned the word Misr, which is Egypt. I was like, okay. So I assume that she's coming from Eritrea. She connected in Egypt, most likely Cairo. She is connecting in Munich to go somewhere else. And then I got a piece of paper and a pen and I started drawing her. And then she was drawing like uh, a woman with the two children. And all of a sudden, and I really cannot recall, this is, you know, seven years ago, how we got to a mutual understanding in that she was flying from Eritrea, going to Sweden to visit her daughter and her kids. And she was connecting in Munich and could not explain that to the police. And at that point in time, the policeman came back because he managed to figure out you know, from the, the flight um, schedule, uh, manifesto, the uh, destination and everything else. And I was explaining to him, it's like, yeah, she's coming from Eritrea, connected in Cairo, she's going to Sweden to meet her daughter. And he's like, how on earth do you know that from a person who only speaks Tigrina? It's like, I have no idea, but we tried and we managed to do it. So. I don't have special superpowers, right? I was just curious. So curiosity being the superpower that it needs to apply here, but also the, the interest in others. And I really hope that the next generation, because we talk about millennials and Gen Zs and all that, there's Gen A, right? Gen A right now, they're 11 years old, 10 years old. So uh, the Wisdom Accelerator class of 2023 is going to be a whole new fresh generation. And I really hope that the Gen Z's and the Gen A's are going to have this ability to connect with whoever they interact with at a deeper level, showing respect for their humanity, even if they're not going to be friends for life. Like I'm not in contact with this elderly lady. I hope that she's doing fine. But we had this very powerful, beautiful moment of humanity in which she needed my help. She needed help, period. And I was curious enough to try to figure out, can I help this person? And in many ways, she would have been fine without me, right? The policeman had already found a translator and everything else. But the, the fact that we could connect at that level 
leads me into cherishing this memory as a treasure that I'm here sharing with you. So she gave me value back. And I really hope that more people would have the same mindset. I absolutely love that. And it, it opened up two more things that I really want to touch upon that are so vital. So I've never had anybody answer the question of global citizenship and a world without borders and divisions of humans one from another. Uh, like you did, which is so eloquently done, but also so very true. Um, to, to get that bigger overview effect, that cosmic perspective of, of how the world works and how, how we uh, see each other. But there's some really unique things in there that come to light. The critical uh, mass or the this Dunbar number of 100 to 150 people that, that we can uh, have is is absolutely true. As those 100 to 150 people that we know, they also can have, depending on who they are and how, how, how you know, many different factors can also have 100 to 150 pe people that they know. And this is where that six degrees of separation gets even smaller, where there's maybe three degrees of separation um, to much of a much wider or global audience where it's uh, similar to like what you see on LinkedIn with first degree connections, second degree, you know, things like that. And then <clears throat> we reach this thing called critical mass where impacts, movements, different things reach such a mass that um, it's, it's people aligned with a vision, but also realizing that we're all on this spaceship earth. And so there is a much bigger way to, 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 or a different way to look at that and how, how it can come together to reach out because it, it, it is, it's a, it's a something that is uh, one that I, I'm not gifted with, or I believe anybody else is gifted with to, you know, whether we have a million uh, followers on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, uh, <laughs> the, those social tribes, the, after 100, 150, you're like, I don't know who the heck that person is that I've connected to, and I really don't have any connection to them. Um, but maybe one of my 150 close connections has also a close connection to them, and in some ways we're similarly aligned. In that message transfer or that mission or vision transfer, sometimes the message gets diluted or it's not as crisp and clean as the vis vision that we think it is, um, but sometimes not. Specifically on, on this, uh, what you brought up in your story about the, the lady at the airport is an article that just came out from the forum today, from the World Economic Forum uh, weekly newsletter that I get. In Denver, they did a study where instead of sending police officers um, out to address complaints, uh, they sent out healthcare workers. And um, the statistics, the data on, on these calls and how much better response there was because there was more empathy, there was more connection with those people one-on-one -on -one where we tried to figure out what was the emotional and physical status, what was the mental status of that person instead of presenting with a gun and, and this authoritative or this criticism or critique or skepticism, which a, a police officer, which is unnecessary for an 80 year old woman going to visit her family who's unarmed just because she's from some certain place um, is, is not the right, we're not putting the right face forward to those type of interactions with people. Instead, when we present them somebody with a bulletproof vest and a gun on and in a very authoritative and uh, different type of presence, there's fear that emerges. There's all sorts of other things that emerge where it makes it so difficult to communicate or to find out those things. And I'm not saying the healthcare workers, right? But maybe it's someone uh, a, a, a teacher, a learner, uh, someone who presents wisdom or some kind of a, another person exactly like you, whether that's a healthcare pro pro uh, professional or a global citizen or an advocate or, a, a, you know, whatever the term is, that 
sees the person as they are, tries to understand the differences, tries to say, hey, we're all on the same planet together. You're a homo sapien like I am. There's no, doesn't matter where you're from. We're all, we're all distant cousins in some degree. There's very little separation of us. And I, I want to understand and help you. And as that occurs, there's a form of this uh, symbiotic earth or this homo symbios that emerges where, where we have a much different view, uh, um, different cognitive shift in awareness, a different form of um, consciousness where we connect to not only our earth, but to our distant co cousins and say, well, why are we fighting against each other? Why are we blocking each other off? Let's let's help and do it in a positive way. And so I thought that was interesting, whether that the, the police officers were that, that way or not, there's, there's a certain type of uh, just adherent message that we're sending when we're sending military or police officers at all to, to speak to somebody in, in that manner, it sets a different tone. And that's what they specifically realized out of this, uh, this article and the study that they did in Denver, Colorado, is that um, the amount of deaths went down and the amount of problems that they had with uh, uh, jailing or imprisoning people from contacts with police officers went down uh, one out of four connections. And the majority of those were racial type of issues with blacks and people of other languages, cultures, and at different appearances than the majority of police. Marcelo, it's really been amazing so far. Uh, we, we could spend hours to days discussing, uh, and I know uh, you know, uh, in the different events we've been in, we, we have taken quite a bit of time together to talk and get into the depth of things. And that's why I really appreciate you and, and love you being on, on the show and, and getting into the depth and substance of this. and removing bias and getting into sense making that's so important to me i have this is really the the hardest question that i have for you today and it's the burning question wtf and a lot of people are oh yeah i've been saying that a lot these past you know 11 months uh, but it's not the swear word it's what's the future Oh, you, you surely kept the easiest questions for last, right? <laughs> um, the future is whatever we're willing to define in the sense that humans have so much potential that is being wasted for the silliest reasons, right? Usually ignorance and not ignorance in a bad way. Ignorance is in not knowing. And we are all ignorant about most things that are out there uh, to learn. And I believe that the answer of what's the future is going to be very closely correlated to our ability to understand ourselves. It's the oldest saying in the philosopher's book, right? It's know thyself. Uh, that's been probably around for the last 5,000 years or so. And uh, it is something that most people don't try to do in a proactive way. They are always trying to run the treadmill that tends to be very much manipulated by media and you can get into big corporations, you can get into advertising. We're really easy to manipulate, but not if we know ourselves. As in today, uh, I was um, rushing around trying to get things done and I could tell because of certain things that I've done in the past that uh, it was just wrong. Like, you know, why am I feeling stressed when in fact I should be enjoying the fact that I can do so much in a single day in a beautiful place uh, like Venice without the tourists? I mean, this is just incredible. You know, you barely hear uh, any language on the streets other than Italian. I've been here for close to a week now. So uh, that element of gratitude is a very, very useful tool. Like, you know, just sort of not stop and smell the roses and do nothing, but hey, you know, if you stop and smell the roses for a few seconds and that allows you to reset, 
your brain to have a more positive outlook in life, those are very useful and very powerful seconds. So it's very much worth uh, doing that. So the ability to understand uh, your path and how much of it you're controlling yourself and the decisions that you're making because someone else is nudging you because they make money out of it or they get more power or they have more influence. It's okay to do that. If you want to give them money, you want to give them power, allow them to be more uh, influent, that's fine. But make sure that you're making a conscious choice. And that is an area of uh, eternal improvement. If you can always know more, we can always make better connections um, in the fields of our knowledge. And I think that the element of gratitude, the element of curiosity, the element of caring, like, you no, know, try to treat every single person you meet as if it's your potential best friend. And I, I know that it sounds a bit foolish, but I, I remember when I was in my early 20s traveling in Brazil, I was born and grew up in Rio, I was traveling far um, from there. And I um, can't quite recall what was the situation, but I had to ask for directions, no GPS back then. And um, there was a postman, right? So very simple person, he just, you know, extremely healthy, you know, postman. Uh, actually, going postal means the guys were in the distribution centers. The, the postman was walking, you know, miles and miles every day. They tend to be totally fine with what they're doing. They don't go postal at all. And uh, hey, postman, he'll know for sure where to go. And he couldn't speak very eloquently. He didn't have the fancy words, but he was so helpful. He deeply cared. And that triggered on me the carrying back. So it's like, hey, I now remember a few years ago, I saw this ranking of um, the approval rates by Brazilians on multiple services. And the post office was up there with 90 plus percent approval because they're really good, right? Or at least it used to be back then. And I shared the story with him. And he had this smile few teeth were missing and nope, but the smell just stayed there. And he was so proud of what he was doing. Like I gave him a, a gift that probably stayed with him for more, longer than that day. And that got us into the conversation where I was asking, why are you so good? Like what drives you? What's your motivation that uh, leads you into being the number one? Of course, politicians were the last, no, nothing new there. But I was surprised, like postal services, okay, no, I, I can see why, but no, you are the expert, right? You barely got any primary schooling, probably don't have any certificates or whatever, but please teach me, like enlighten me what makes you so good. And that conversation lasted a long time with someone that no, usually I'll, I'll never interact with. So I really hope that people will see other humans as their potential best friends, even if that friendship is, going to be a very short one right no i was moving around traveling uh in my country but it was very powerful and um, it um, leads me into closing my argument here if that could be called an argument with um, my uh, favorite poem my uh, a favorite poet is a brazilian called vinicius de moraes who used to be a diplomat and wrote amazing books and he actually wrote the girl of ipanema Right, that he uh, is the author of the lyrics. In one of his poems, he says uh, he had many love adventures and um, he was an extremely bright man and very charming. And uh, he sent a letter to one of his loves saying that our love may not last forever, but it shall be eternal while it lasts. And I really hope that as humans, we can love other humans for a short period of time, but make it good, make it intense and make it worth it. Oh, I love that. That's uh, been one of the best answers I've ever received off of that question. Thank you so much, Marcelo. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Teach. Like teach whatever. No, learn how to be a teacher because by teaching others, you're learning. And, uh, it restructures the way you look at a topic that you thought that you knew so much about. Right? So I've just given 
a lecture uh, to an M MBA class uh, in uh, Mumbai uh, called um, In Pursuit of a Life Worth Living, because as you know, uh, I do certain crazy things like fasting for longer than Buddha and then climbing Mont, Mont Blanc, which is the highest mountain in the Alps, like a month later. And uh, the uh, fact that I had to talk to MBA students who are still in the early 20s and they have bright uh, futures and so many uh, possibilities in life uh, forced me to structure my thoughts. Right? I had to prepare the presentation the day before because I just couldn't get it done. Um, it was stuck somewhere. It's like, how can I get the message across? And it turned out to be a presentation about six words. I, I picked three words from ancient Greek, three words from more modern Greek. In fact, they're neologisms. They're not created by Greeks. They just use the uh, uh, Greek components. And uh, that allowed me to share those stories in a very cogent, structured, and useful way. And you know what? Those thoughts are now very clear to me because someone asked me to teach others. So I'd say, whatever you're doing, make sure that you teach others. If you think it's worth teaching, uh, pro, you know, go to a group and propose them. I mean, what to do with Wisdom Accelerator literally is asking hundreds of people to share the wisdom stories. So it's very, very focused. Like, you know, imagine that, hey, you're talking to yourself as a 15-year-old for 20 minutes, what would you talk about? But it's incredibly varied, right? So um, I think that if people had the mentality of teachers uh, on the daily lives, they will benefit in so many different ways. So my answer is just the word teach. Great. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make a real impact? Hmm. Impact is very personal, right? You can measure certain things and sadly money is used to measure success because it's easy to count, you know, so easier to keep score. But I really hope that uh, whatever they decide to do, they do it from a perspective of value. And value is not money, right? Money is just an incarnation of value. And it's also a way of trading one value into another. And the impact is usually maximized when you focus on something that you deeply care about. So one of the things we want to do with Wisdom Accelerator as a phase two. So we continue with the online sessions and do the you know, live sessions as well. But we uh, want to give them a minimum framework that to give them good choices for them to pursue if they wish to do so. And that would be through mentorship. So they want to impact uh, value, learn from someone who's been doing this for a long time. So uh, one of my sneaky tricks of inviting hundreds of speakers is that I'm going to get back to you guys saying, hey, would you like to be a mentor and commit one hour a month or so or every three months and talk about you know, food technologies in your case and so many other things that you could be talking about. And uh, that way you have those mentorship groups and the teenagers who are interested in food, they'll be joining a session uh, once a month, but they'll be trying, uh, choosing many sessions that are relevant and resonate to what they're trying to learn. So you want to have impact learn from people who've been there before. I mean, it it's, sounds so obvious, but most people don't do that. Most people don't do it. It's, uh, there's a good friend of mine, John P. Strelecki, he wrote a bunch of books, but he says, find the who, find the, the person who is already doing that, who has done it, who's written about it, who's the expert, and then get that value from them, follow their example, their mentorship. And I think that's very similar to what, what you're saying as well. I, I, I totally agree. Yeah, so that this is one element, the mentorship element that we try to structure now. The second one is internships, right? Give value, right? give value first. So uh, what we want to do is from when the participants are 13, 14, they can start joining those mentorship groups from when they're 16, 17, they can join internships that could be done virtually. So you live in New Zealand, you want to work with artificial reality, no problem. There's a company in Silicon Valley that has lots of micro tasks in terms of marketing research or data entry or some sort of analysis. You can do like a few hours a week, a few hours a month, 
you get the title of internship, you have responsibilities because you're signing a contract with your parents, of course, signing as your supervisors, and you're giving them the value in the sense of the labor, right? You're helping them out and you're learning from that and they respect you for that. And then you get something you can put you in a university application form. I've done three internships in three super interesting industries, but give the value first. And the third one is entrepreneurship. So I, I call that my wisdom fleet because it has three ships, you know, mentorship, internship, entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship has a lot of senses, like the broadest possible uh, perspective of if you're an artist, you're an entrepreneur, right? You know, you, there's an enterprise which is to cover an ugly wall with a beautiful painting and you need funding for that. So the one thing that we want to do after uh, the participants have gone through mentorships and internships, they're doing well, they seem to be ready uh, to go to the next level. As soon as they're 18, or maybe even before, if the parents want to back them, they can apply for grants and funding from angel investors, like a micro venture capital fund. And if they want to set up a company doing something like services, which you can do remotely, wonderful. They want to do drop shipping and start um, uh, you know, at that level of trading, also amazing, right? So make sure that you're learning from people who have been there before, that you give value first so that they keep on you know, getting involved and you can go deeper into the relationship and make sure that you understand what you want to achieve by yourself and ask for help, but only ask for help when you can show to people, I am serious, right? I've been doing this since I was 13. I've gone to many mentorships. The feedback has been great, both from my side and from their side. And then I got to a few internships. Now I'm asking for money to paint this uh, ugly wall because it benefits my uh, neighborhood. I have a track record of getting stuff done and being capable of working with older people who are willing to help the uh, next generations. And with this little wisdom fleet, I'm uh, hoping that's a model that can be copied by many people around the world. And there's a multi-year journey as uh, no uh, walk in the park, but uh, I believe that this is how we're going to have better humans in the future. I love it. What have you experienced or learned in your professional life and journey so far that you would have loved to know for the start from the start? I think the know thyself is the most important one. And uh, you always think that you know yourself until you challenge your body and your mind to a, a much higher degree. And you go like, oh, wow, I, I was capable of doing this and I didn't know, right? And it could be anything, right? The uh, challenge is uh, your way of labeling problems you face in life in a way that generates value long-term. I wish I had challenged myself more at a younger age, which is exactly why I created the Wisdom Accelerator. So you can have those teenagers realizing that they have incredible power. And curiously, we uh, created a concept around three years ago. Uh, you know the story, right? With my daughter doing crazy, interesting things. Yes. And um, having realized that her life was full of magic and she has so much potential, if she chooses to follow that potential, we we're trying to figure out how can you scale magic? How can you make sure that magic is part of the life of every single teenager on the planet if they're ready, if they're looking for it, right? We, it, it's not the uh, the push-pull thing. It, it's basically, look, we, we're here. Like, we, we don't sell. We're marketing. This is a nonprofit structure where you can become wiser if you choose to do so. And once they realize that they're capable of doing certain things because they have the right level of support for public speaking, for becoming entrepreneurs, for whatever it is, they will have um, much greater boundaries. Like they will feel so much more confident going like, wow, this really seems to be very difficult, but that's fine. I mean, when I decided to summit Mont Blanc solo, like from the hardest starting point of the Chamonix Valley, the view of the goal was very obvious. You're getting to the summit, right? You're enjoying the summit. I was not rushing there, taking a gazillion pictures. I was the last person to come down from the summit to have some sunset shots. 
you know, I've been doing rock climbing for 10 years, so I, I know when it's safe, when it's less safe. Uh, so please don't do something that is going to put you in an unsafe situation, whatever it is. But the uh, fact that you can create uh, a space where teenagers, and that's our focus, can try certain things. Let's say they're trying to do the equivalent of climbing Mont Blanc. Please don't. In fact, you wouldn't even be allowed to because it'd be illegal to try to do that. Uh, but if you have like uh, the equivalent of Mont Blanc and you only manage to climb half of the mountain, you haven't failed. You, you climb half of Mont Blanc. You have achieved something that 99.99% of other teenagers, in this case, or basically people in general, have never done. Right? So be proud of what you achieved, understand why you couldn't go further, and also that there are certain things that you can do, like when you're tired, learn to rest, not to give up. Like if the aim is worth achieving, make sure that you give yourself the best shot at doing that. And also understand that most of the greatest things that humanity has done in the past, it was not easy, right? It's basically a layer upon layer of learnings and failings and everything else. And the biggest concern I have with society is that everything needs to be immediate, instant gratification. And this is terrible. And that's something that hopefully <coughs> putting people into a situation where they struggle, but they learn, they will learn that struggle is part of the journey. In fact, you no, know, they are the bricks that build that house. I agree. That is really all the questions that I have for you today, uh, Marcelo. But was there anything that you wanted to let my listeners know or something that we didn't get a touch upon that you'd like to mention before we say goodbye? Well, I'd like to congratulate you and thank you for uh, having those sessions. I know that uh, you're connected with really interesting people and uh, it's awesome that um, you're, you're sharing and caring, trying to get the message uh, across. And um, I would also like to mention that anyone who would like to join our sessions every month, it's like during the last weekend of the month, we have a full weekend with um, lots of speakers talking about what made them wiser and faster in the past. And we also have the events that we're planning for 2022. So anyone who's interested in joining our sessions can go to our website, it's wisdomaccelerator.org. Uh, for the online sessions we do every month is neoa.org. You have the uh, program uh, there and we do have a YouTube channel which is in beta right now but have you know, dozens of talks uh, that uh, people can uh, benefit from so um, thank you so much for getting the message out there and uh, uh, that again is free we're a nonprofit, and uh, the more the merrier thank you so much Marcelo it's been a sure pleasure and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and and uh, I hope we see each other live very soon uh, Give you a big hug and uh, get back into some even in-person deep dives. Thanks so much. Likewise. Thank you so much.